Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone, we are going to be starting a new topic today and it's called Metabolic Diversity. As the name suggests, this is an extremely large topic and it has been spread out over two modules. So three parts, uh, it's, it's actually uh, split into six parts. The first three parts are part of module 11 and the remaining three parts are part of module 12. Uh, so we'll start with part 1. This is lecture 56 of module 11. So this particular topic is actually uh, one of the biggest topics in this course. We are going to really understand how uh, different species of bacteria have adapted themselves to different conditions in terms of electron acceptors, electron donors and so on. So this is real uh, examples, these are real examples of environmental microbiology and you will be able to appreciate the enormous uh, diversity in terms of microbial uh, abilities uh, in this particular topic. So in today's uh, first part, we are going to look at phototrophy and within phototrophy, there are two major types of reactions, light and dark reactions. Now, uh, we have by now a fairly good understanding of the fact that there are certain species and certain groups of bacteria that are capable of utilizing light energy, photo energy and uh, they, they may be autotrophs or they may be heterotrophs. So these are organisms which get their energy from light and they will convert that to chemical energy and they will use CO2 um, as their carbon source in which case they are autotrophs or they will use organic carbon as their carbon source in which case they would be called photoheterotrophs. So you have two types, you have photoautotrophs and photoheterotrophs. They are all light harvesting uh, species and therefore they need chlorophyll for doing that and that's something that you're already familiar with. Now there are two sets of reactions like I mentioned, there are light reactions and dark reactions. So the light reaction is basically utilizing the light energy, converting it to chemical energy and ATP is generated from the proton motive force and we will go into a little detail about this as we go along. The second set of reactions are called dark reactions. Here, the chemical energy that has been harvested using from light is going to be used to reduce CO2 to organic compounds. So that is, um, there are two ways of doing that. Now, electrons for reducing CO2 from different electron donors can be done in different ways. So here we have two examples. We have what are called oxygenic phototrophs and we have Ox, uh, an oxygenic phototrophs. So under oxygenic phototrophs, the electron donor is water, oxygen is produced. Remember this is the reverse of the respiration reaction. In the past we have looked at aerobic respiration where glucose plus oxygen are converted to CO2 and water. Now here in this case what we are doing is we are reversing that reaction. CO2 plus water are being converted to oxygen and sugar or other organic compounds. So this is the normal photosynthesis reaction that we are all familiar with. Back from high school biology and science, whatever you have learned, this is the one that is most common. So that is called oxygenic photosynthesis or oxygenic phototrophic organisms are capable of doing that. All higher plants, all the green plants that you see around you, small ones, large ones, whatever size they are, some pigmented bacteria as well as algae are responsible for oxygenic photosynthesis. Oxygenic photosynthesis depends on two photosystems. They are called photosystem 1 which is based 
on harvesting light at the at the wavelength of 680 nanometers and the second one is photosystem 2 where uh, 700 nanometer wavelength is harvested so light energy in the form of these wavelengths is what is being utilized and in the process ATP as well as reducing power are generated and if you remember again back from uh, aerobic respiration you remember that reducing power can be used to generate ATP so that is that remains the same thing we also have another way of photosynthesis and that is called anoxygenic photosynthesis or the species that are responsible for this reaction are called anoxygenic phototrophs. So they are capable of using reduced forms of sulfur like hydrogen sulfide and elemental sulfur and oxidizing them to sulfate and hydrogen. Now here the reducing uh, power is carried by NADH or NADPH and the examples of these bacteria are purple and green sulfur bacteria. Only one photosystem is used and that is called P870. Proton motive force is generated and then utilized for generating ATP. So again it is similar to the previous one. Uh, you can also refer to the figure in the text for this. Let us take a little closer look at chlorophylls. How are chlorophylls? We all know that chlorophylls are essential for photosynthesis. That much is known to all of you. But how do they function? So if you remember again from cell chemistry as well as biology, I was talking about cytochromes. And um, cytochromes are porphyrins. So similarly, chlorophylls are also porphyrins. And instead of having iron at the center of the porphyrin ring, we have magnesium at the center. So that is the basic difference between a cytochrome and a chlorophyll molecule. And now you have any number of examples of different types of chlorophylls. So plants, algae, cyanobacteria, they have chlorophyll A and some of them have chlorophyll B. Bacteria have what is called bacteriochlorophyll A and it goes all the way to G. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, I'm not going to go into any of these details. I've been saying this um, often very frequently throughout the lectures that this is your assignments are all open book by definition. So you can always refer to the textbook for the greater details and answer the questions in the assignments. So here we have the absorption spectra for chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Like I said, whenever you are looking at an object and you see it as a particular color, it means it is reflecting light of that color and absorbing all the other colors. Remember that black is something that absorbs all colors and white is when all colors are reflected. So same thing here, when we see a plant as green, that means it is reflecting, there is no absorption over here, it is reflecting green and it is absorbing. The highest absorption is in the blue region and the red region. Both chlorophyll A and B are absorbing light in the blue and red regions. So uh, the maximum absorption for chlorophyll A is at 680 nanometers as well as 430 nanometers and chlorophyll B has maximum absorption at four, um, 615 nanometers followed by 480 nanometers. Bacterial chlorophyll is quite similar. It is present in anoxygenic phototrophs like purple and green bacteria. Maximum absorption is kind of off the scale, it is towards the infrared region and that is 800 to 925 nanometers. Where are the chlorophyll molecules located? Um, I will refer you to the text again where there are several schematics explaining where the chlorophyll molecules are located. So here is the chloroplast. The chloroplast contains the chlorophyll molecules and we have already seen uh, in previous uh, topics we have seen where the chlorophyll is located. So it is located in the thylakoids. So here is the chloroplast. It has an inner and an outer membrane. So you have the inner membrane and the outer membrane and between them there is the intermembrane space. So this is the envelope, the chloroplast envelope. And the thylakoid is basically these stacks. The stacks are the grana or the granum 
and the stroma is the the uh, what what can you call it you can call it the uh, empty spaces between the grana would be called the stroma so these uh, convoluted membranes of the thylakoid is where the chloroplasts are located uh, the nucleoid is present in these thylakoids you also have ribosomes in the stroma you have um, again let me back up a little bit yeah so the nucleoid is freely floating throughout the stroma as, a, as are the ribosomes and you also have storage granules like starch granules and so on now we come to the light harvesting module so how does the plant or the bacteria that is photosynthetic algal cells bacteria plants how are they harvesting light there are two types of molecules that are present uh, some of them are the reaction centers are proteins that are fixed in the uh, in the cytoplasmic membrane and the antennae chlorophylls which are shown over here in light green color the reaction centers are shown in dark green color what you see here are that for every reaction center there may be 50 to 300 molecules of the harvesting light harvesting chlorophylls and again i will refer you to figure 17.7 .7 in the brock textbook um, this is a very simplistic schematic of how light energy is taken up by the antenna molecules and channeled so all these 50 to 300 molecules are channeling this right en uh, light energy to the reaction center the reaction center contains chlorophylls and that is shown in dark green and this is the site of the electron transport reactions which we will be looking at in the subsequent slides so the site of photosynthetic activity where electron flow is started or initiated happens at the reaction center so for the locations of the bacteria chlorophylls reaction centers antennae molecules all of this are shown very clearly in the text and you can refer to that let's now come to some other pigments so after chlorophylls you can see that the chlorophylls have two basic <coughs> maxima in the absorption spectra but it kind of limits the plant or the photosynthetic organism to a very uh, small range of the visible light spectrum now there are other accessory pigments which are called carotenoids and phycobilins and these are accessory pigments so when you see plants with yellow green red these kinds of um, uh, colors these are accessory pigments that are giving these plants those colors you can also find them in algae you can find red algae you can find um, pink algae all these colors are there in both microorganisms as well as higher plants and these accessory pigments have two major uh, functions to perform the first function is they increase the absorption spectrum of that organism so instead of just absorbing in two uh, major bands they ex extend it so if it's a red colored <coughs> if it's a red colored uh, pigment then again it will reflect red light and absorb green blue and yellow so these are uh, accessory pigments that enhance the ability of the organism to harvest light throughout the visible spectrum so you have yellow red or green pigments that can absorb blue light and remember that blue light has higher intensity compared to red light so this really makes a difference in terms of uh, the light harvesting capacity of the um, organism and it's therefore its ability to survive now these are membrane bound pigments that participate in photosynthesis i've also mentioned a second thing and that is photoprotection remember again that beyond the visible light spectrum you have uv light on the blue side and infrared light on the red side now this uv light is high intensity light and it's capable of causing mutations in the dna so it can cause uh, adverse problems it can uh, damage 
the genetic code, it can damage the cell organelles and so on. You all know that uh, UV light in many uh, cases has been um, uh, blamed for uh, higher incidence of skin cancers and so on in human beings. So um, similarly for plants and other pigmented organisms, it can cause severe damage to the genetic uh, material of that organism. So photoprotective agents are required and these carotenoids perform that function by absorbing blue light okay so simply by absorbing blue light they are protecting the rest of the material of the organism from damage um, in general the number of carotenoid molecules is equal to the number of chlorophylls and um, I've already mentioned all the other points and then we come to phycobilins. Phycobilins are also similarly pigmented molecules but they are water soluble pigments that are not attached to the membrane. So that again extends the capacity of the organism to harvest light energy. So uh, coming to how the electrons are transported and how energy is generated. Let's take photosystem 1 which is present in anoxygenic photosynthetic organisms like the purple bacterium. So here we have a particular molecule, it's a pigment and it's capable of absorbing light at 870 nanometers. So that's why it's called P870. Now 870 nanometers is in the infrared range. It's not necessarily visible light, it's somewhere between visible and infrared. So when light falls, when this wavelength of light falls on this molecule, the molecule gets, a, there is some excitation of the electrons, the electrons are bumped up to a higher energy level. So you can see that the electron potential increases, okay, and then this molecule, this, these set of electrons are then passed through the electron transport chain. So you have uh, bacterio, uh, bacteriophyophyton, you have a series of quinones, quinone A, quinone B, quinone pool, and then cytochrome BC1 and cytochrome C2. This is a series, if you remember the electron transport chain in aerobic respiration where we are generating um, reducing power as well as ATP and remember that reducing power is used for generating the proton motive force and the proton motive force is in turn used for generating ATP. So the same thing is happening over here. The electron, the excited electron is passed through these series of electron carriers and in the process reducing power is generated, it's an energy consuming reaction and that's what the light energy is all about and you have ele external electron donors like hydrogen sulfide, thiosulfate, elemental sulfur and ferrous iron. Now all these electron donors after having donated, remember these electron donors are giving their electron here at P870 and when that gets excited by the light energy it's being passed through these electron carriers. So that is the oxidation of the electron donors is happening over here and reducing power is generated which later on will be used for generating ATP. Now it's important to remember that light is doing only one part of this process. So the only thing that light energy is being utilized for is for exciting the electrons. And once the electrons are excited, they will pass spontaneously through the electron carrier chain and the rest of the reactions are no longer light dependent. So now that we know that uh, cyclic uh, photophosphorylation uh, can happen, leading to anoxygenic photosynthesis, uh, let's also take a look at some examples of uh, various types of bacteria or various bacterial species that are capable of anoxygenic photosynthesis. Uh, you can, if you have access to uh, Brock's uh, biology, you can refer to the 10th edition or even subsequent editions and look at figure 16.12 which shows cyanobacteria growing on sulfide 
and utilizing sulfide as the electron donor. Uh, they also have a figure, uh, figure 17.5, which shows the locations of the reaction centers, the light harvesting molecules, the electron transport chain and the ATP synthesis process. I will talk about that in a little bit in the next slide. Um, so before we uh, go too far, let's just take a look at some of the and oxygenic phototrophic bacteria. So one of the most common ones or the most uh, studied one is uh, Allochromatium venosum. There are several other examples, uh, bacteria that are capable of using reduced sulfur compounds as electron donors. They are all capable of anoxygenic photosynthesis. So you have the purple bacteria that is, um, there are several species that are mentioned here, purple non-sulfur as well as sulfur bacteria. There are green sulfur bacteria, chlorobiaceae, the green gliding uh, bacteria, chloroflexaceae, and the gram-positive heliobacteria. There are several other oxygenic cyanobacteria that can oxidize sulfur and they are the ones that generate um, elemental sulfur globules and these globules as I mentioned I think in a uh, previous uh, slide these sulfur globules or elemental sulfur globules can be found either inside the cell of the bacteria or outside the cell. So there are any number of examples in the reference shown here at the bottom of the slide as well as in the textbooks. Okay, so up to this point we have looked at anoxygenic photosynthesis. Now anoxygenic photosynthesis happens by cyclic photophosphorylation. But what we are all more familiar with is oxygenic photosynthesis which happens by non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Now non-cyclic photophosphorylation is based on two photosystems instead of one. We have photosystem two. And uh, photosystem 2 is also based on P680. The 680 stands for the wavelength of light that is utilized by photosystem 2 and the electrons in this are bumped up to a higher energy level from where they enter the electron transport chain which you see over here in the graphic and they are transferred from P680 to P700 which is photosystem 1. Now this transfer of electrons is associated with the proton with the development of the proton motive force as well. So while the electrons are being transferred through the quinones and the cytochromes the protons are also being pumped out of the uh, cytoplasm into the periplasmic space which you can see over here. So a proton motive force is generated and then subsequently this proton motive force is going to be utilized to generate um, to generate ATP. Okay so that is how ATP is generated and um, the only major difference between let's say aerobic respiration with, where you see a similar uh, kind of process. Uh, the difference here is that ATP as well as reducing power in the form of NADPH are utilized in the Calvin-Benson cycle to convert CO2 to carbohydrates and other organic compounds. We will take a look at all these processes in a little bit. So I think I can uh, just go through this uh, graphic one more time to explain the same thing. So we have uh, the generation of oxygen uh, when water is converted to oxygen, electrons are released and these electrons enter photosystem 2 because of the light energy they get bumped up to a higher energy level. They pass through all of these uh, cytochromes and quinones, they are all collectively called the quinone pool and these electrons then hit P700 photosystem 1. Again more light energy is utilized at this point. The electrons are further excited and unlike anoxygenic photosynthesis they are not recycled back to photosystem 2. Instead they are transferred to NADP plus to form NADPH.
Okay, so these are membrane bound iron sulfur proteins, ferrodoxin and so on. Now there is one step which is not shown over here but is shown in, um, it's shown in the textbook in I think Brock's textbook and that is where uh, the electrons from ferrodoxin are transferred to cytochrome BF complex and that is where the cycle is completed. Uh, so there is a transfer back of the electrons as well, uh, but that's not shown in this particular figure. You can refer to Brock's textbook for that. We then come to the Calvin-Benson cycle. So like I said, the last part of photosynthesis is where you have uh, fixation of CO2 into organic matter. So the conversion, what we have seen up to this point is the utilization of uh, water and the generation of oxygen or uh, elemental sulfur and so on. So in oxygenic as well as anoxygenic photosynthesis. Now we take a look at Calvin-Benson cycle which is common to both types of photosynthesis uh, um, processes and this Calvin-Benson cycle happens in terms of carbon dioxide fixation. So this is autotrophic carbon dioxide fixation and these reactions are not, they do not require light. The only thing that is required is ATP and reducing power in the form of NADPH. Okay, so uh, let me just see if I have anything now. So I would uh, refer you to figure 5.25 in uh, the recommended textbook for this course. Tortura Funken case. Uh, so there is a uh, figure 5.25 uh, shows you a very simple schematic which uh, gives you some information about how CO2 is taken into the Calvin Benson cycle and then uh, utilized to form what are glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate molecules and uh, two of these G3P molecules are then combined to form glucose. Okay, so that's uh, an example of how uh, carbon dioxide is fixed by photosynthetic organisms. So to produce one C6 molecule, 18 ATPs and 12 NADPH are utilized. So we have three steps in the process, carbon fixation, reduction and regeneration of ribulose. Uh, so let's start with the very first step. In the first turn of the cycle, uh, one carbon dioxide molecule is added to ribulose bisphosphate which is a C5 molecule and this is a carboxylation process. It's mediated by what is called the Rubisco enzyme and you can refer to the figure. Now the figure in the textbook shows the budget for three turns of this cycle. So in one cycle you don't get much so in three turns of the cycle you will get G3P which is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and it takes another so two of these so six turns of the cycle will give you one glucose molecule. So in the figure in the text you have three carbon dioxide molecules that enter the cycle one at a time by being added to ribulose bisphosphate. Now in the reduction part the second step three of so let me back up here a little bit one carbon dioxide when it is added to ribulose bisphosphate generates a C6 molecule. So three of these C6 molecules are cleaved into six molecules of C3 compounds. Now these C3 compounds are 3-phosphoglyceric acid which is then converted to 6 molecules of G3P and in the process 6 molecules of ATP and 6 molecules of NADPH are utilized. With 3 turns of the cycle, one new glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is formed and this is after a few turns, this is excess glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So that can leave the cycle and there are still two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate uh, that are remaining. To regenerate ribulose, you need 5 molecules of G3P 
to remain in this cycle. So G3P is a C3 molecule and 5 molecules means you have 15 carbons that are available. Now these uh, carbon compounds are rearranged through a whole series of reactions and the end result is 3 molecules of ribulose, ribulose being C5. So you get 3 molecules of the original uh, ribulose compound and that is the full Calvin Benson cycle. So that is, uh, it's only when you get this excess G3P that is formed that can leave the cycle and when you have two molecules of G3P that will allow you to generate one glucose molecule. So I'll end this part of metabolic diversity here. Thank you.